Welcome, my name is Harald Sack. And I'm Antan. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number five, Ontological Engineering for Smarter Knowledge Graphs. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about knowledge graph construction. So, how can knowledge graph construction be achieved? Of course, you can do this manually, for example, with human collaboration. However, there are also automated methods because many times what we are going to use is, for example, either unstructured text source, so the knowledge that we want to put in a knowledge graph is already described in some texts, or we are looking at structured data resources. For example, there might be database tables that we can use directly and then transform somehow to a knowledge graph. And this is what we are going to tackle in this lecture. We start with knowledge graph construction from unstructured text. And of course, if you have unstructured text, it means this is text given in a natural language. What you have to do is you have to apply techniques from natural language processing. As they are, first of all, you have to identify about which entities the text is speaking. So this is entity recognition. And those entities, they have to be mapped to a reference knowledge graph, for example, to DBpedia, to Wikidata, or to any other reference data. So this is then entity linking or entity resolution. But this, of course, is not the whole story. If you have the entities, you need to know how they are related with each other, other from the text. By that, you have to identify the relations. You do this usually with techniques from relation extracting. And then what you do is also map your relations to a reference knowledge graph because you might use a property that has already been defined somewhere. So this is property linking. Further analysis then you have to do to create meaningful triples, which means overall what you have to do in the beginning is part of speech stacking, constituency and dependency parsing, really to find out of what is going on there in that sentence. And since not everywhere entities are named by their real name, you also have to do co-reference resolution and in the end semantic row labeling. But how this works, Anne will tell you in our example. Yes. So let's say we have this unstructured text. The Ambassadors is a 1533 painting by Hans Holbein the Younger, also known as Jean de Donville and Georges de Selve, after the two people it portrays. It was created in the Tudor period in the same year Elizabeth I was born. So that's our text. So we see here we have one, two sentences. Okay, so the first um, NLP technique that we are showing you here is part of speech tagging. Part of speech tagging involves looking at each and every token and then classifying this token according to the part of speech tag. So here, for example, the is tagged as the determiner. And here we are using Stanford Core NLP to illustrate to you how each and every NLP technique happens. Okay, the next thing we are showing you here is named entity recognition, where uh, you look at each and every token again and determine dimensions that correspond to the entity. So for example, 1533 is considered the date Hans Holbein, the younger, that should be the correct um, entity, refers to the category person. So um, this is not exactly 100% correct, but you can see how it works, right? So here you also see two as a number, and Elizabeth first is a person. Okay, so as you can see, we have one simple sentence, and the second sentence is a very complex one. It has a lot of pronouns. So co-reference co takes all dimensions that are available and then map it to, a, to the same entity. So here it knows that it in the second phrase of the second sentence and the other it pronoun in the third phrase, they both belong or can be linked to one entity, okay? but. Here you can see that it wasn't able to link it to the first uh, entity, the ambassadors in the first sentence. Yeah. So this is just an approximation. And then lastly, we show you um, information extraction of core NLP, which is called OpenIE. 
And here we can see that um, OpenIE was able to detect that the ambassadors is an entity and the relationship that exists between the ambassador and, and the 1533 painting by Hans Holbein is is. And at the bottom, it was also able to um, identify the entity pairs, it and Tudor period, and the relationship that exists between these two entities, which is was created. Mm -hmm. So, very nifty tool. Yeah, and based on these informations, you then try to identify exactly what entities are referenced and how they are connected with each other to connect then meaningful triples in the end. Yes. But it's only part of the story. So mm -hmm. if I want to create a triple now from the sentence, the ambassador is a 1933 painting by Hans Holbein the Younger, what I would do, you know that already, I would paint a graph in the way like that. So I would have here an entity, the ambassadors, the relation is is a, uh, and then, of course, it's a 1953 painting just for the sake of brevity. However, we have a few more information there. So, for example, if it says it's a 1953 painting, we as humans know this refers to a creation date. So that would be the creation date, 19, uh, 1533, not 1915, of course, sorry. And it was painted by Hans Holbein the Younger, because we have here by Hans Holbein the Younger, and we know painting, of course, is painted. So this is, again, uh, tricky to find out in mm. an op automated way. The next step then would be the mapping of our names that we have found out, of the terminology that we have used there, to existing uh, properties and entities. So we will find the ambassadors, for example, here in DBpedia. So there is the ambassadors by Holbein, it's there. We can use the DBpedia property here and of course the literal stays literal, and we say, yeah, this is an artwork. So RDF type is a, you remember that, mm -hmm. it's an artwork. And uh, of course we need somebody who has created that, and then we might reuse for that purpose um, DBO author. Unfortunately there is no painter in DBpedia, so we are, since I want to use here the same ontology or the same uh, context, I use DBpedia author here to denote that Hans Holbein the Younger was responsible for the creation of the ambassadors. Okay, so because um, this video um, is currently being recorded in March 2023 and everybody's abuzz with ChatGPT, we'll show you how ChatGPT came up with the same knowledge graph construction task. So we told ChatGPT to create a knowledge graph from the same text and ChatGPT was able to come up with the following. So it was able to um, determine that we are talking about a painting. So RDF, uh, RDF is a painting that was created by Hans Holbein the Younger and also the creation date 1533 and so on and so forth. Then we asked ChatGPT to create the same knowledge graph using RDF turtle serialization. So it was able to show us that we are talking about the ambassadors as an entity, which is a painting that was created by Hans Holbein the Younger and so on. So very good <laughs> ChatGPT. <laughs> However, when we asked ChatGPT to link the existing entities to Wikidata, Yes, it was able to put some of these entities or link some of the entities and the properties to Wikidata individuals and properties. However, if you check each and every reference here, you will see that it's not very precise. It's not completely correct, that's yes. true. Mm -hmm. But still, still impressive. Yeah, yeah, not bad. Yeah. Okay, so this was the part where we want to wanted to give you a glimpse on how to do knowledge graph construction based on unstructured text, but there are also, let's say, easier and simpler, uh, let's say, scenarios, for example, when we are dealing with structured data sources, like, for example, relational databases, as we have here, or tree-structured sources like XML or JSON. Unlike the unstructured text, where knowledge has to be extracted, so that's mm -hmm. often imprecise, as we have seen, structured data sources often can be precisely mapped to a knowledge graph. And usually you do a two-step general mapping, you see here, so we create a mapping from the source 
to the graph and then we use the mapping in order to materialize the source data as a graph or to virtualize the source, which means creating a graph mm -hmm. view over the legacy data that we have here. Okay, so let's start. Yes, so let's start. As an example, we want to show you R2 RML. This is a language for specifying mappings from relational data or structured data to RDF. So what kind of data does R2 RML take? So here we say it takes as input log a logical table, for example, a database table, a database view, or an SQL query. And using a triple map, it then produces RDF serialization. So let's look at the details. So as I've said, an R2 RML takes as input not only the logical table, but also a triples map. And the triples map we have to define. And this triples map contains two parts. Okay, the first one is a subject map where we define which or what column are we talking about here? What will be the column that relates to the subject? And then we also have a list of predicate object maps with where we combine the predicate as well as the object of our triple. And then as output, yes, I already mentioned that the input would be the triples map and the logical table. And the output of R2 RML would be a triple for each row okay, of the logical table. So each row will have the subject resource, which includes the IRI and are often referred to as the primary key of our table, as well as several triples with the same predicate, uh, several triples with the same subject, specifying the predicates and the objects, which are generated from the attributes of the row in the table. So say, here's a very concrete example. We have a table here called paintings with three columns. So we have the ID as our primary key and two other columns to specify the title and the creator. So here, the R2 RML uh, file we have is serialized following the turtle convention. So first we say, that here we are specifying a triple map called painting map. And it takes an input the logical table, specifying the table name, as well as def definition of our subject map. And in the subject map, this is where we build our IRI. Mm -hmm. So in this example, we just say that we already have um, an IRI paintings at example.org slash db taking the ID from the column ID in our logical table and we say that this subject is of type dbo art. Mm. Okay, so then we say now we're done with our subject map, we define our predicates map to refer to each of the columns in our logical table. The first predicate map, we define it to have a property RDFS label. Okay, and the object is uh, a literal that takes the value from the column title. And this literal will have a language tag EN. And the next predicate object map we have will refer to the column creator. Okay, so how does it look like? Once we put our R2 RML file and the logical table together. It will serialize it to a turtle file. Here we can see one, two, three of RD, RDF type TBO artwork with RDFS label, the ambassadors, and so on. And in the triple and, and triple um, serialization, this will be how it will look. So, but you notice that our IRI here, we just build it uh, because we don't have, I mean, we assume that we don't have an existing knowledge base, but that is not the case. In reality, as Harold mentioned, there's already an individual that refers to Hans Holbein the Younger. So we can simply link the subject map here 
to Wikidata, but this is a completely different task, which is entity resolution, which we will not discuss in detail. OK, so now we have shown you how we can um, construct our knowledge graph from unstructured text and also structured data. The next lesson, in the next lesson, we will talk about ontologies and knowledge graphs, best practices.